Testing, can you hear me? Is this, is this registering? Yeah? Bill Preble gives me the uh, thumbs up on the EV check. All right, good stuff, good stuff. Well, I'd like to welcome everyone to today's lunch. I've got uh, a number of housekeeping items to go over on the programming calendar. Um, I'll give you a preview over the next uh, couple of weeks. We hope you're able to join us. On the 24th, uh, which is next Wednesday, if you think back over the programming calendar, we've covered everything from uh, economic issues, macro issues, strategists, a lot in oil and gas, a number of company presentations, a lot in equities. Haven't really hit the fixed income market. So for the next couple of weeks to fill in that box, we have uh, Craig Blessing, Managing Director from BlackRock. He's going to provide an update and current outlook on a high yield and bank loan fixed income market. And then the following week on May 1st, it is our annual meeting to members, but we're going to have James Raleigh, the senior investment analyst for Vanguard. He'll talk a little bit about the fixed income portfolio construction, strategic implementation, and, and consideration. So you have um, sp uh, specific on, on a product and then a little bit more about uh, portfolio construction. Following that, we have a panel discussion. That's on May 6. That will be in conjunction with uh, CABE. So that's a Monday. Emily Kolinsky. Morris, who's the economist, a head economist, or one of the economists for, for Ford Motor Company. And then Brett Hoselton, who's uh, the, the senior analyst for Key Bank Capital Markets. Emily will talk a little bit about her outlook economically with a focus on the uh, auto industry. And then Brett will talk a little bit about, um, a little bit about Europe, uh, his macro outlook, and then boil it down to stock selection. The following week, uh, May 15th, it's a uh, reschedule for Jay Muthaswarmi. Kent State University PhD, latest in high frequency trading. The 22nd, we'll, uh, we'll have Mark Poharian, Vice President, and Matt Miller, Investor Relations with the Hershey Company. And then uh, we finish up on May 28th with our annual membership dinner at the Terrace Club Progressive Field with uh, Bob DiBiasio and a special guest from The Motley Fool. Um, after that, uh, in June, I think it might be June 5th, I don't have the date, um, but I think it is June 5th, uh, we finish up the programming season with Tractor Supply, a uh, nice large cap uh, company to, to finish up with. So today, uh, it is my distinct pleasure to welcome John Rogers. I would like to um, recognize, uh, prior to introducing John, uh, our sponsor for this lunch. So as everyone in this audience knows, sponsorship has been you know, a major initiative for us over the last couple of years. and. Um, uh, the, um, the initiative has allowed us to bring in, I think, some pretty high-quality uh, speakers. So today, uh, as part of that initiative and, and um, in a recognition for their sponsorship today, State Street Global Advisors, uh, Spiders, is sponsoring today's lunch. Um, so John joins us from the CFA Institute. He's the uh, President and Chief Executive Officer. He's got over two decades of, uh, of, of investment experience uh, spanning the globe. He was with Citibank and with Cigna in Japan and Australia. And then he joined Invesco. And, and Invesco had a very impressive resume and, and managed a number of groups. President and Chief Investment Officer, Invesco Asset Management, Japan. CEO and Co-Chief Investment Officer of Invesco Global Asset Management, North America. And then CEO of Invesco's Worldwide Institutional Division which has over $200 billion in assets and 2,500 employees. Prior to joining the Institute, he started and founded an 07 Jade River Capital Management, and then joined the Institute in 2009 as, again, the President and Chief Executive Officer. Today, um, John's got a, a, just a great presentation, and I think we'll talk to you know, current CFA Institute initiatives, and then an update a little bit on its mission with a broader mission, bolder voice, and a bigger tent. It's my pleasure to introduce John Rogers. Well, thanks, Craig. Good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me if I stand out here? Can you hear me OK? Good, good. I, 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 I uh, disappear behind these, these lectures. Well, thank you very much for inviting me back. It's been a couple of years since I was last out here, and I guess uh, I guess I can sort of update you on on what's happened in the last couple of years from the standpoint of CFA Institute. Uh, but I'm going to do that in the context of the global financial crisis, which, frankly, two years ago when I visited you last, I, I thought would be well in the rearview mirror, uh, and it is in terms of market levels, but 
but it's not in terms of investor confidence uh, and trust. So what we're doing right now together uh, at CFA Institute and, and here in, in Cleveland and around the world is really, is really driven in part by that. Uh, so let me frame the, the issue, if I can make this work. Yes. Uh, we've had markets recover to, in many cases, all-time highs uh, in the Dow and the S&P 500 and, and in other major market indicators. But all the uh, surveys of investor confidence and trust remain pegged at very low levels. And I think one of the reasons why is this constant drip of bad news, or, or gush in some case of bad news, week after week coming across in the, in the press, describing uh, illegal or unethical acts by individuals in the system, starting probably with Bernie Madoff, with firms themselves, and this is just an example, the LIBOR scandal, major financial institutions being implicated, uh, and, and actually also at the systemic level where you know entire financial systems have just gone down the, the gurgler, uh, most recently in Cyprus. And, and that steady bad news flow, combined with the fairly fresh memories of the financial crisis, had led, has led to uh, an erosion decline in trust in finance that has stayed at a low level. One way to measure this was done by a, a man named John Taft in a, in a book that he wrote called Stewardship, which is an excellent book on how this industry really should operate. And they did a survey and asked people the first word that came to mind when they heard the term Wall Street. People around the world, and this is a word cloud, the size of the word corresponds to the number of times it was mentioned. Uh, and this is a very, very unpleasant picture for, for all of us who care, who care about this industry. It's, it's troubling. Uh, it, it really is quite upsetting. It's not why we joined uh, this, this profession. Now, uh, this is a picture you probably can't see so well, but it's tandem skydiving where, anybody tried that? Anybody ever done that? Braver than I am. Uh, where, where you have one parachute and two jumpers instructor gets strapped to the student, the student is actually paying money, and the instructor has the parachute tied to their backs. And, and so my question is, why are both of these guys smiling? You know, because only one of them is actually guaranteed pretty much to survive if, if the chute opens. And, and in a way, that's what's happened with the, with the industry. Uh, participants, investors, feel that they've been taken for a ride. And the, the social contract to get to the point, the social contract between investment professionals or the finance industry, to, to take it writ large, and the public that we serve, that contract has been broken. Make no mistake. And so professions and industries were not given divine rights to exist. Professions and industries, including our own, exist thanks to a social contract, right? Uh, and in exchange for services, members of the public agree to place their trust in, in, in a profession and in an industry. And when that social contract breaks down, bad things start to happen. And ultimately, the industry gets regulated back to the status of a utility, or it gets plowed under, as has been the case in Iceland, to some extent in Ireland, will be the case in Cyprus. They're taking both of the large large banks, major banks down, um, and don't think that it can't happen here. We were in India with, with the governors uh, of the Institute in January. It was fascinating. We were talking about these issues, just a bit of a diversion here. And we were with a group of people that work at the Reserve Bank, the Central Bank, and they were talking about what they call the unofficial financial sector. It's basically the black market. And it turns out that in emerging economies, close to 50% of financial transactions, hey Denise, 50% uh, of financial transactions occur off the books. And that comes in the, in the form of real estate transactions that are worth 100 that get marked, at, that, get, that actually get recorded at, at a value of 10. Or the gold market in India, which is enormous and is almost completely off the books. The point is that, that what we think of as finance, what we think of as the financial ecosystem only exists because we've earned that right by building trust. And now we face a situation where trust has been broken. 
and that's that has terrible, terrible implications. <clears throat> it's not just. In fact, at the end of the day, it's not at all about job losses in our sector. That's bad enough for, for those of us who are in the, in the business. And I know there's been consolidation here in Cleveland. The real problem with the loss of trust in financial services and financial service providers and the trauma of, of declining markets and volatility, the real problem is that investors become defensive in their behavior. And you can all think of clients either individuals or families or even institutions who reacted badly to the events now close to five years ago and sold near the bottom and didn't reinvest and are hoarding cash and are hoarding hard assets that are not returning uh, productive use to society. And so what's happening is the emergence of a retirement savings gap on a global basis that is a direct consequence of the loss of trust. Now a retirement savings gap as all of you recognize, because your your members, most of you, or all of you, members of the institute and smart investors, you recognize that a retirement savings gap is an enormous asset liability mismatch. It is effectively borrowing long, 20, 30, 40 years. In an institution's case, much longer. Borrowing long and lending short. Now, what's the normal shape of the capital markets line? and the yield, the yield curve, it's normally upward shaping. So that's the worst thing you can possibly do for your, for your own personal future or the future of your institution. But that's the behavior that a loss of trust in finance creates. And down the road, not very far down the road, the implications of this could be that older folks need to work longer. That older folks go to the ballot box in greater numbers and force a transfer of assets across generations in ways that we haven't seen for many, 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 many years. Uh, and also stress, just political and economic and social stress between generations of haves and have-nots. So these are very profound problems. So I want to convey, if I haven't already, a sense of some alarm and some unease about this situation in which, which of course, markets are better, and that feels very good for some. But there are many who have not benefited from this updraft in capital market prices over time. So what can we do about that and this situation as people who care about this profession, who, who've dedicated many, many years of our lives and a lot of work to this profession in this industry? There are some things we can do. A couple of years ago when I was here, I, I made the reference to board's ongoing work on long-term strategy. Well, that work is complete was completed about a year ago. And one of the most significant changes, <coughs> more than just symbolic, in, that's resulted from that is that the board has actually expanded the mission statement of CSA Institute. And the underlying words here are the new words that were added by the board. So we exist to serve and lead through globally through education, ethics, and professional excellence. But why? For the ultimate benefit of society. And, and I just felt a, a tremendous renewed sense of purpose and meaning here when the board uh, agreed and voted to do that. I, I just think it captures so well uh, what any professional association should be thinking about as we get about our business. So that expanded mission statement, which really kind of just affirms what I think all of us already do, has, has given us a new and, and expanded sense of purpose. And, uh, to kind of show you the pathway that, that, we're, that we're all going down, we really operate in two broad areas. We educate, and in some case, accredit people who participate in this industry. And we also advocate for uh, investors' uh, rights on a, on a global basis. So it's that combination, and they go hand in hand, of education and standard setting and advocacy that we we believe can help over time to tip, hopefully, to the positive side of the ledger, global financial markets that serve the public interest. Because, as I said before, global financial markets that don't serve the public interest will be uh, eliminated probably at the ballot box or by regulators. It's just a fact. Um, and, it's, and we've had plenty of examples of that. So 
For the next few minutes, I'd like to now focus on a couple of specific initiatives uh, that, that we're working on at the Institute uh, around professionalism. And I'll mention the new uh, learning certificate program called Claritas. But I'd like to start by talking just for a couple of minutes about professionalism, because <coughs> restoring trust, it, it really starts with you, the participants in the, in the profession. It starts with me. It starts with us, with what we do. Uh, and so I'd like to just talk about that for a second. Uh, the Beatles. <laughs> Why are the Beatles in this presentation? Well, uh, Malcolm Gladwell, uh, uh, this, I sort of borrowed from this one from his work. Daniel Pink's another, another great writer who has talked about this. But the Beatles burst on the scene here in the States in sort of the late 60s. And, and they were seen at the time, uh, for those of us old enough to <laughs> have experience that, uh, they were seen as geniuses. You know, people thought they were almost aliens. They were, their music was so extraordinarily polished and different. And, and so they came across to this country and were viewed as, as geniuses. But in fact, as, as Gladwell notes, they had spent four years in Northern Europe, primarily in Hamburg, working two to three gigs a night and practicing all day to perfect and create and hone their music, their tone. Uh, and they had worked, they worked like dogs for years. So that when they arrived and made the big time, they made uh, being masters seem very easy. And we can come up with lots of examples. Uh, uh, Bill Gates is, is another classic example who you know, founded Microsoft. He was a boy genius, right? Well, in fact, his father gave him a crude PC when he was 13 years old, and he went upstairs to his bedroom every afternoon after school, and he spent the, the rest of the day programming. So by the time he quit Harvard at, at 20 or where, wherever he quit Harvard, he'd had thousands of hours of experience programming computers. So he, so he may still be a genius, but the point is, the concept of 10,000 hours to mastery is a reasonably well-established one out there now. There's, there have been books written about it. There's a book called Mastery. Um, and, and in fact, it has some <coughs> academic uh, underpinnings. So how do we stack up as CFA charter holders? Well, you've got to have, you've got to pass the three exam levels, which take about 400 hours per exam. So that's 1,200 hours. And then you need four years of qualifying work experience, another 8,000 hours. So, just to get the CFA charter is about 9,200 hours of academic and practical experience. So I think we stack up pretty well. But let me contrast that with what, goes, what can go on here in Ohio. Anybody familiar with what's required to become a registered investment advisor in this state? Probably gone through the process. So how about anybody, anybody, anybody know what it takes to be a barber in this state? I'll tell you, to be a registered barber in the state requires having passed an accredited school of, bar of barber barbering, 1,500 hours of practical experience, and a principles and practice exam, multi-hour exam, plus continuing education. To be a registered investment advisor in this state, below a certain level of assets, requires an application, and you can pass any of the series exams. Take your pick, any of them, all the way from series seven on up. Uh, some of those exams you've probably taken, and some of them are extremely easy. Now, CFA charter holders are waived for all that, but so are a whole bunch of other <coughs> programs that are much less rigorous than the charter. My point simply is that you know, if you think about a person's health and well-being, there's physical health, there's mental health, and then there's financial security. And yet to practice and to take someone's hard-earned savings and invest them in the marketplace in this state requires almost no training, no educational credential whatsoever, no continuing education. There, I would suggest, is an opportunity for us collectively to say something about professional standards right here in this state. And I say the same thing in every state that I, that I visit and in most other countries. It's easier, it's easier to manage someone's entire nest egg than it is to cut someone's hair, right? Both of which are honorable, honorable skills. So we've got a lot of work to do there. 
Um, now, to get after this issue of, of restoring trust, the board has asked us to launch a project, which we have just, we have just launched, and it's called the Future of Finance. Uh, and the purpose of this project is to seek to uh, provide tangible work, work product, back into the marketplace that can help uh, restore a sense of trust in a practical way and reconnect financial services back to the, the real economy because financial services have gotten a little bit out of kilter with the society and economy they were meant to serve. So that's what the board's asked us to do. And they've given us uh, six different thematic areas. So I just want to take you through those. Here's an advisory board that we've just put together. We haven't announced it all yet, but you'll recognize some names here. Mary Shapiro, Bob Posen, who ran MFS, Bob Schiller, wrote an excellent book, Finance and the Good Society. John Taft, I mentioned um, stewardship. Andrew Lowe at MIT, of course. Any of you listen to or watch Bloomberg TV, you recognize Tom Keene, who's a charter holder. Uh, so, you know, we think it's a strong group, and they're going to help us uh, uh, in a very grounded way with, with the work project itself. The stakeholders in the future, future of finance project are, are really all of us, all industry participants, educators, uh, societies, we're going to work with, with local societies, uh, thought leaders and that sort of thing. And we're working on six, on six themes. So let's just go through those. Uh, the, the first theme is, is putting investors first. It's one of our tried and true and, and still very valid uh, uh, rallying cries. Uh, the fiduciary duty, as we call it here. Now, in the States, as you know, the fact is that broker-dealers and insurance agents are not held to fiduciary duties. They're only held to security <coughs> standards. And that really isn't good enough, in my opinion. Uh, if, if you're managing someone's money, even if it's on an advisory basis, and they feel that they're entitled uh, to have you work solely on their behalf, and, and you don't, then there's a mismatch. And, and we know it's easier to educate investment professionals than it is to educate you know, 350 million people. So, the onus is on the profession to make that right. Uh, the first thing that we've actually published around this is called a Statement of Investor Rights. And I've left a few copies out there on that table. You're welcome to take them with you. Uh, it's really meant to be a mirror that a client can hold up to a potential counterpart in financial services and say, OK, before we do business, would you, can you tell me how you stack up on these points? And what we've done to build this, working, working with advisors, and market participants is to take the code and standards that we all ascribe to and boil it down, boil it down to basically 10 very simple statements of what an investor is entitled to expect. So that's the example of work product that we're going to be generating. Uh, take a look at it as you leave if you'd like. Uh, financial knowledge is another area where, uh, where we believe CFA Institute can, can make a difference here. And this is where I'd like to introduce the Claritas Investment Certificate. Has anybody heard of it yet? Maybe some of the board members might have. Yeah, it's the first, it's, this is the first major uh, uh, learning program that we've rolled out at CFA Institute since the CFA Charter was created 50 years ago. So it's a big, it's, it's a big, big program. It's, we've been working on it for a couple of years behind the scene. Uh, Claritas comes from, well, it's Latin for clarity, but the whole concept comes from a trip that we took to China, and we were visiting with large financial institutions, and they were bragging about the fact they were bringing 20, 30,000 people a year into their organization. So we said, well, how great, how do you train them? And, and they showed us, well, this is where we train the tellers in the art of telling, and this is where we train the HR people in the art of being HR people. And I said, well, how, you know, how do they learn about finance? And so that was a gap. And so now think about your firm. Think about your firm for a second. Think about the people who are not the investment decision makers in your firm, who work in HR, IT, they work perhaps in marketing or communications. Do they really understand finance? At a basic level, at an appropriate level, do they understand how your firm fits into the financial ecosystem? Have they been trained on ethics, the kind of ethical dilemmas that they may encounter? That's, what we're, that's the group that we're trying to reach with the Claritas Investment Certificate. And we think it has very broad application. It's meant to help the whole organization 
the culture of the whole organization by raising the understanding of finance across the broad organization, the company's role in it, and the individual's role in turn inside the firm itself. Uh, we think it's a great confidence builder. So, so this program, so what is Claritas? Claritas is a self-study course. The curriculum is about 700 pages long, so we estimate it'll take the average candidate about 100 hours of self-study. So, you know, maybe a couple weeknights a night and, and three to four hours on a weekend for two to three months. And then the candidate sits for a two-hour computer-based exam, which will see to be available all over the world. We're working through Pearson View. The cost for a single candidate is about $560, but we have bulk pricing. It's meant to be a B2B um, uh, proposition. We expect that, that employers will, will be the main movers in this. Um, we open for global registration next month. Uh, and these are the types of roles within firms that we think, where we think there will be demand for Claritas. Now, we're just concluding uh, the exam process for, a, for a, a pilot group of participants. Uh, again, we have an advisory committee that's helped us steer this, uh, that's really been helpful in, in identifying uh, the topic areas and what have you, and I'm happy to talk about those in the questions. But uh, we have um, over uh, 68 firms. We thought we'd only get 1,000 people in the pilot program. We had an overwhelming response, and we've had 3,500 individual participants coming from 68 firms. This is another word cloud, so the bigger the firm, the more, the more candidates. Cognizant, it's interesting, it's actually a, it's an outsourcer based in India. They're our biggest participant, and they do, um, uh, they, they do back, sort of back office financial work for a lot of large firms. But some other firms that you'd know, you, you know, CalPERS, Bellamy Mellon, BlackRock, State Street, uh, Franklin Templeton, Morningstar from, from this part of the world. Also law firms, the British Broadcasting Corporation as an example of, of organizations who have come to us and said, we want to be part of this pilot. So we think this could be really very, uh, very much a a positive thing in terms of raising the standards of financial literacy within the financial service industry itself. And I'd be happy to talk, talk more to you about that. Another topic that we're going to be working on is transparency and fairness, uh, where cl clearly there's much to be done. Um, uh, transparency and fairness across borders and across products leaves much to be desired. Uh, one of the uh, the offerings that we think comes straight at this is our Asset Manager Code of Professional Conduct. Uh, any of your firms adopted that yet? No? We would go. Okay, thank you, Denise. We've got a long, oh yes, great. We've got a long ways to go. Uh, we're up to about 770 or 80 firms who've adopted this. You don't actually have to adopt it letter, letter for letter. If your firm's code of, uh, code of conduct matches or exceeds this code, you can claim compliance. But uh, our aim is to have what happens to this be similar to what happened to GIPS. So now, if you're in the institutional money management business, you really need your performance data has to comply with GIPS, and you can't really compete on a big stage. And, and we're working to make the asset manager code become a similar threshold level. And why is this important? Well, because there are no, there is no single standard of conduct across the asset management industry around the world. And cer certainly for smaller firms, I mentioned the, the Ohio licensing requirements, that's true state to state in the US. So if we can create a, a decent um, ground level standard and really nudge the industry over in that direction on a global basis, we do think that we'll raise the overall quality of the asset management business worldwide. The next big topic area is, re is retirement security. So, so why would CFA Institute get involved with retirement security, right? Well, the answer is that we owe our jobs to this, to this topic. And I don't think I overstate that. If you, if you leave some of the private wealth business to one side, the whole asset management business in the last 30 years, certainly since ERISA in this country, which was the early 70s, so 40 plus years, is entirely owed to the growth of retirement savings, initially through defined benefits and then, of course, through defined contributions. 
The industry, imagine, imagine your firm, your job without retirement savings at some level. It just wouldn't exist. So we have, we have our industry, the industry has retirement savings to thank for the growth, largely, largely. And this is a global phenomenon. It's an enormous, enormous portion of global total wealth. And it's in trouble. It's in trouble. Um, the, the news flow around municipal, uh, municipal retirement systems in this country is troubling. The state of Illinois is a good example. And there are many large uh, retirement systems on a global basis that are pay as you go or are dramatically underfunded. Uh, and so <clears throat> this is a potentially dangerous systemic issue. And just as we've done with other areas, we think that we can provide some interesting and useful global standards on what a good retirement system looks like. Right? And there, there are organizations out there doing that, and we'll partner with them. But we think we have a stake in this, in this debate, and, and we're, we're going to get involved. Keith Ambekshire has joined this, the advisory committee of um, Future of Finance. And he's a very uh, well-recognized expert in this area. He's written extensively. If you've written FA, or read FAJ, you'll see some of his work there. Uh, the next area is, is regulation and enforcement. When, when people think about, um, uh, about finance and, and, the, and the, the global financial market crisis, they think about these areas. But it's so complex, I'll tell you. We work, we work hard on this. Uh, but we're trying to bring a little bit more simplicity to the problem. This is an unreadable, and not meant to be read, because uh, it's hideously boring, chart of what firms in the EU face when they face off against regulators. So the blue circles are the types of, uh, types of financial service companies, banks, banks on the far left. And they're, uh, they're, they're basically uh, shot through with, with five different sets of regulations and they're facing that whole suite of issues along the bottom that are common to all financial service providers. The point is, is that all of you understand, who are out there in practice, understand how difficult and cumbersome relations, the regulations have become. And yet, uh, we, we continue to experience these, these meltdowns and financial crises. So uh, we want to, to add something uh, uh, around practical solutions and practical ways forward that avoid adding to this, this terrible, this terrible spider web. The last area I'd mention, uh, and then we'll, we'll get on to questions, uh, is safeguarding the system. Uh, nobody wants to see another <coughs> crisis like the one that we've just gone through. And yet, uh, we are not in any way convinced that the steps that have been taken so far will protect us from another one of these. And uh, fortunately, it, it was sort of 70 years between, between the, great, the Great Depression, the stock market crash of 29, and, and this Great Recession. But again, there's absolutely no guarantee that, that we won't get another one in 10 years. Um, and the trauma that was caused and the damage that was caused by the last one um, may be fading into our memories. But uh, they, were, they were profound. They really were. And they left us some damage. So, Doing something about systemic risk uh, beyond just just waiting for the markets to recover is what we must be involved with. So we've launched last year, uh, as just one example, the, the Systemic Risk Council. This is a US organization that we've partnered with the Pew Charitable Trust on. Sheila Baer, who many of you may know, uh, was former chair of the FDIC, a very brave and, and uh, thoughtful woman. Uh, she chairs this council, and uh, uh, we, we've got a terrific group of, of thought leaders on this, and this group is out there uh, making uh, constructive observations about, about lowering systemic risk in this country, some of which are very controversial, I will say, and, and may, some of you may not agree with them, but we've got to be in the discussion as, as CFA Institute, we really do. So these are the six topic areas with just a little flavor of the kinds of things we're doing inside each one. At the level of, of where kind of the rubber meets the road, which is our local societies right here, we'd love to have you participate in this, in this project, in this program, in ways that make sense for you and the local community. And one example might be to convene some of the industry leaders 
from financial services and, and really have sort of a salon on, well, what is the future of finance in Cleveland? I know there's been a lot of change, but to what extent ha has there really been some thought placed on where does the financial service sector fit in this local economy and where does it go? What does it look like in the future? So that's just one example of ways in which uh, we, can, we can all get involved in this. Uh, have your firm take a look at the asset manager code. Think about uh, perhaps trying out Claritas. Take somebody in your organization who you think is sort of a, an early adopter and might benefit from this and sign them up and, and, and tell us how it goes uh, and, and get involved in, in uh, reaching out and restoring trust in any way that you can. Speak at, at your local Rotary Club uh, about, about what finance can really do that's very positive because there are so many things. So, I know that you all have a good rule about hard stops at 115, so um, I'll, I'll make a hard stop to my presentation now. And, and I'm happy to take questions about, about you know, anything you'd like to. Yes, thank you. Yes. Does CFA Institute have a position on too big to fail? We, uh, we have come <coughs> out in support of, uh, 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 well, I won't say of the bulk of rule per se, but we have uh, come out in support of separation <coughs> Of, um, uh, of traditional commercial banking from investment banking. And actually, the Systemic Risk Council has done more work on this than the Institute itself has. We sort of let them take that topic area to some extent. Um, the council is meeting on May 8th and is actually going to talk about very specific proposals to actually break up large banks. And this is going to be very controversial. I don't know if they're actually even going to get to a consensus on this. Uh, it's, it's a thorny issue, so uh, I wouldn't say that we've hit straight at it, but we've we've, we've been dancing around the fringes a bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's an issue that's faded a little bit recently, but I was in London last week, and I, I just couldn't believe how how incendiary the atmosphere over there is toward the banks right now. I mean, just constant topic on the talk shows, the radio shows, the media in all forms. Um, it's, it's actually really scary because, because London's economy is so dependent on financial services. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Other questions? Other questions? Yes, sir. Um, concerning trust, I think your comments were, were right on. Um, the fundamental unit of the financial system is money, right? And, and money in this country, in most countries, are just paper. In this country, paper and your name. Mm -hmm. There's so you rely on the Fed to keep that trust in the dollar. Mm -hmm. um, with the money printing, QE, whatever they want to call it, um, what are your comments on how they are uh, doing their job with respect to trust in the monetary system? <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I guess when I, heard, when I heard you start with the fundamental unit in finances, money, I, I thought you were going to say trust. Because actually, what stands money behind right exactly what stands behind money? It's just a promise, uh, and and so, uh, you know, venturing into a discussion of of what what's happening <coughs> with the production of of the asset, you know, the massive production of, of an asset that um, is already in heavy supply, which is just you know fiat money. That's a, that would become a personal discussion. My views on on the marketplace um, and the institute has typically you know, not talked about that sort of thing until or unless it becomes a systemic risk, uh, which you could argue that it is becoming on a global basis. So you know, we, haven't, we don't have a view. I have a view. I worry about it a lot. Um, there's probably only a few people in this room who've actually been market participants during an age of inflation, right? And, and uh, those that remember it will never forget it, most likely. But those who've never experienced it have no idea what it is. It's like, it's like uh, it's like the story of the two fish that are young fish, they're swimming along, and this older fish swims by going the other direction, and the older fish says, how's the water? And the younger fish look at each other and go, what's water? And so that's, it's like that with inflation. You have no, we, have, we have no idea what that feels like, right? None. Um, and, and so we can talk about it, and we, we think we can prepare for it, but, but it, we, we really aren't prepared for it until it happens and then it's too late. So that's kind of venturing into personal commentary. But, but remember the fish in the water. 
you know, and, and, it, and it always, these things always happen far quicker than you expect it, it to happen and, and in a way that's different from what you expect to happen. And if I've learned anything from being around the markets, it's, it's that, you know, so, yeah. Most of the comments you fashion deal with institutional approaches to these issues. Mm -hmm. But, you know, our, I guess my reading of the, of the past 10 years or so has been there's been a lot of bad actors, individual bad actors. Regardless of the institutional framework, there would have still been bad actors. How does what you propose end up dealing with that particular venture? Well, you can never. There are there are sociopaths out there. Um, you know, you, you use you use uh, you use the term bad actors. There, I think there are a lot of sociopaths out there, and, and unfortunately, some of them find their way into finance, and they just don't, they don't care uh, about what they're doing. They they really are criminal in a lot of ways, um, and and so you can't totally you know you can't totally prevent those people from doing what they're going to do. However, I believe that that the culture of the firm has an enormous amount to do with minimizing that type of behavior. So a healthy, it's, it's, this, it's this old story of how you build a successful organization, right? It's smart plus healthy. Companies that are just smart aren't going to succeed. Companies that are just healthy may not have the right products, but if you get smart and healthy together, you can go anywhere. So a healthy culture to me is the kind of culture that you build in your firm where as part of the onboarding process for new employees, there's a pretty good look at that person's values. You actually test for the values that you have at the firm, and the instant that you see something that you don't like, the warning flags go up. And we've all seen and worked in firms where there's a superstar salesperson or a superstar portfolio manager who's also a jerk. And everybody knows it, and everybody puts up with them, and why, you know, why don't we get rid of them? So those, making a healthier culture at the firm can do a lot to, to weeding out bad actors, but you can't keep it, you know, you can't keep them all out. Um, I guess that's the best I could do in terms of answering your, your question. So healthy, healthy culture, healthy firm, the asset manager's to, uh, code of professional um, conduct is, is one way that firms can use that. It's kind of a litmus test. And, and you know, I, I think firms should look at it and say, how well are we doing on these, on these various um, metrics? <coughs> Ma'am, you had a question. Uh, I was wondering if the CFA Institute, um, what type of lobbying or representation do they have in Washington, um, you know, to represent the CFA Society and also the members? And also, what is your position on pension reform? I mean, do you have a position mm -hmm. on recommendations and how are you advocating for this? Yeah. Well, to take the second question first, this, this future finance project and the, the pension um, sort of sleeve within that is meant to get to that point, to, to hopefully a statement of, uh, I think we're, we're pretty well known for being a standard setter. So if we can establish a set of standards, best practices for a pension system, and then go down from there, like drill down to each one and do monographs and, and conferences and the things that we do. So that's kind of where I hope that goes. Uh, in terms of presence in Washington, it's an area that we want to uh, raise our profile, not so much through lobbying, where frankly, we don't have the firepower and I don't have the taste for street fighting that's required for lobbying. It's a very ugly and expensive business in Washington. Um, what we can do, though, is to act more visibly in a consultative role in the rulemaking process and in the uh, implementation process at the, regulated, the regulatory level. So we have two people on staff who focus on Washington. Um, and we actually just announced yesterday, uh, kind of internally, but to society leaders as well, we just created a new America's division within CFA Institute. Strangely enough, we never had one. We have Asia Pacific and Europe, <laughs> Europe, Middle East, and, and Africa. But because we come from here, we never actually had a formal resource apply to the Americas, and now we do. And Tom Robinson, who some of you may know, he, he, he led our educational division. Actually, came, I was reminded, came out of Case Western. I think that's where he got his PhD. Great guy. He's going to head that group. So he will help us focus more on Washington. And, and frankly, also on getting that information to you as members so you can make your own decisions about issues as they're emerging. 
You know, this fiduciary standard issue, I mentioned broker-dealer insurance companies, and that, the SEC has asked for comment on that. And it may actually come to the point where, where you want to weigh in personally. You know, some of you may be against it, some of you may be for it. But helping us connect you with Washington better is something we should do. So, yeah. Um, this is a subject that came up a couple years ago and then died late. Has there been any further conversation around continuing education? Continuing You're right. We, we raised the topic of a continuing education um, almost two years ago. We, we wanted to take the temperature. So maybe you don't know this, but there is no continuing education requirement to keep your charter at CFA Institute. Um, uh, the issue, in order to, to create mandatory continuing education, two-thirds of you would have to vote in favor of it. It requires a supermajority vote. The issue came to the members 13 years ago. Denise may have been on the board at the time. I don't know. You wrote the letter to the members, so you have the scars to, to prove it. She can tell this story a lot better than I can. Denise is a former governor at the Institute, as you, as you know. But, uh, and it was, it was a huge battle, very bruising. And, and other factors may have gotten involved, but at the end of the day, the membership voted it down. So we went out to test the waters in light of the global financial crisis, thinking now's the time. You know, we, we need to show the public that we're going to the next level. And we did listening tours all around the world, major cities, groups of members at large, folks who never come to these meetings, and those who do. And there's not the support out there, I'll tell you. It's just, it's, we, we would not win the vote today. And so rather than go through the embarrassment of a law, of a, you know, and the publicity of, of, of this, which I think would hurt us, we, we, chose, we chose not to go to, go to the ballot box. Um, now, having said that, do I think that, that virtually all of our members do way more than, than the average professional in terms of staying up to speed? Yeah, absolutely. You know you do. You have to to compete in this industry. So it's almost pro forma to, to, to make a requirement. But, you know, Analysts are smart people. They're, they, they see, why would I have to fill out a bunch of forms for something I'm already doing? So that's the answer. We, we, we did not go to a proxy vote. Yeah. Good. OK. Any other questions? Yes. Do you know of any um, societies that already have a local teacher's alignment counselors around? Uh, let's see. The closest, we're, this is really early days, um, the closest I would say would be in the UK, where they're, they're, they've launched a wonderful program on professionalism. They actually asked for some financial support, which we were happy to provide, to do some advertising around the topic of integrity and professionalism. So when you come out of a, a tube station in London, you're going to see, in addition to all the junk, you're actually going to see a, a nice, clean ad for integrity and trust and professionalism. And so they're, they're, they're participating. They have a little advisory group themselves. So yeah, that's been really neat to see that. Yeah. With the uh, Clericons uh, program, um, can you just comment a little bit about uh, the content, you know, how much is, is ethical, you know, ethics, yeah. what's your responsibility? When, when I go back to my firm and say, hey, this we need to implement programs such as this for our support people mm -hmm. and a certain standard. Where, where, where are they going to be at? Yeah. Uh, you, can, you can easily see the content areas and the weights. If you go to the website, or just, just type in, in the search, just type in Claritas and you can see it. But to make a long story short, ethics are about 15%, I think, of the curriculum. Uh, and the way that we approach the curriculum is we actually start with the big picture. You know, with, with the CFA program, you start at this tiny granular level. Um, of sort of microeconomics, and immediately it's just on, on to the march, right? But this starts with, okay, I participate in financial services industry, what does that look like broadly? And then we fold back down into narrower topic areas, economics, financial instruments, um, market participants and types, um, uh, dealing with clients, those sorts of things. And there's no math involved. Nobody has to do a calculation. Um, but it's rigorous. I mean, we're not going to put a product out there that doesn't live up to the standards that all of you would expect. So, so, that, and so, it, so it starts at the broad view, goes into to tools and, and, and participants, and finishes, again, with treating clients fairly. That's kind of how it flows. And we've, we've attempted to make it quite interactive, 
their online learning tools that we're bringing up. So you know, people who are engaged in this program are going to be different, perhaps, kind of learners from, from people who've been through the CFA program. And we've tried to take that into account as we've written the curriculum and, and written the learning tools. Yeah. John, is it targeted toward college degree professionals in other sectors, or is it really targeted toward you know, your administrative people? Uh, yeah, there, it's a good question. There are no prerequisites whatsoever. Um, <coughs> It, you just have to, to pay for the registration. And the target group is, is anyone working in financial services who, you know, frankly, I would say is not either a, a, a CFA aspirant or a potential CFA charter holder or somebody up in the C-suites. You know, you're not going to have your CFO sit for this. But um, we really think that firms should look at it as an onboarding tool. I mean, in addition to the people in the firm who our administrative assistants or HR people, marketing people, IT people, ops people. Um, you know, I, I asked you to think about your own firm. I'll bet, I'll bet you've got at least a few <coughs> names in your mind when you think about it. You know, this would be perfect for that person. You know, I used to ha always have a few copies. You remember the Barron's Dictionary of Finance and Investment Terms, that little book with the blue, blue cover? So I used to carry that around because people would come up and say, I'm, I'm really embarrassed to ask this. But what is a what is a derivative, and and you realize they were walking around the firm doing their job well, but they they had no idea how it worked. You know, it was all jargon. So instead of this dictionary, now I can say, check out Claritas. <coughs> yeah. Okay. Any other questions? All right, we're getting towards the hard stop. Thank you very much for your attention and patience. <laughs>